Kim, are you ready? Okay. Good afternoon. It's great to see all of you here. Welcome to the October 6th meeting in the Marshalltown Rotary Club. Uh, Karen Farr will lead us in the prayer in a bit. Good afternoon. Last week I read to you the prayer that started the Republican National Convention, and this week I will read to you the prayer that ended the Democratic National Convention. And let's hope it's all over very soon. <laughs> this is from Sister Simone Campbell. Oh, shoot, I forgot my glasses again. Sorry. <clears throat> oh, Divine Spirit, during the weeks and months ahead, stir our hearts and minds that we might fight for a vision that is worthy of you and your call to honor the dignity of all your creation. 
a vision of who we are as people grounded in community and care for all, especially the most marginalized. A vision that cares for our earth and heals the planet. A vision that ends structural racism, bigotry, and sexism so right now in our nation and in our history. A vision that ensures hungry people are fed, children are nourished, immigrants are welcomed. O oh Spirit, breathe in us, our leaders, a new resolve that committed to this new American promise, we will work together to build a national community grounded in healing, fearlessly based on truth, and living out a sense of shared responsibility. In the name of all that is holy, O oh Spirit, bring out of this time of global and national chaos a new creation, a new community that can, with your help, realize this new promise that we affirm tonight. With profound hope, let we, let we the people say, Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Carrie. Do we have any guests today? Okay, seeing none, Jackie Wyatt will introduce our student Rotarians for the month of October. <laughs> I would just ask that Eli and Catherine join me up here at the microphone, please. And as they're coming up, we do plan to continue having the practice of student Rotarians. Right now, we have a slight challenge with our hybrid schedule. Uh, so for example, we have a student who has a, a very important calculus class going on right now. And this would be the only day that she would see the teacher in person. So she really didn't want to miss today uh, because of that important teaching that's going on. So I appreciate your patience with them. She'll try to be here some other time during the month. But in the meantime, I've asked Eli and Catherine to introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Elijah Thiessen. I'm a senior. Um, my parents are Red and Wendy Thiessen. Um, school. What do you do at school? Um, I'm really, I'm really heavily involved in music, um, band, choir, jazz, metro choir, all the, all the different. Things, not orchestra though. Um, and kind of next year, I'm kind of looking at Southwestern Community College in Creston, Iowa to do their vocational music program so we can learn more about music and performing it. Hi, my name is Catherine Flores, and I'm a senior. I run cross country and track. And I got accepted to Iowa, so I'm planning to go there and become a PA. My parents are Ryan and Kelsey DeMoss as well. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Um, Kim is going to announce the birthdays for the month of October. Okay, happy birthday to these Rotarians in October. Paul Beals, Roger Chase, Anita Ellingson, Doug Gervich, Paula Hartman, Vic Helberg, Bonnie Lowry, Bob McGregor, Scott Neff, Doug Reese, Bobby Shomo, Mike Tepper, and Jeff Vance. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. And now we get to celebrate the Rotarians who are celebrating their anniversary of joining the brewery. And so uh, I hope that most of you have found a little quiz on the table in front of you to see how well you know your uh, Rotarians. And so I'm going to ask all the folks who are on that list uh, to come forward at this time. This is a 
pretty impressive group, right? And Kim has just added the answers on the, on the screen, so you can double check yourself and see how many, and then you got right. I'll leave them up so you can check it out. <laughs> but um, I just would like to say how uh, wonderful it is to have so many of you here today and to let us celebrate with you the fact that you've been Rotarians um, for such a, many of you for many years. So first of all, Christy Fisher, if you would come up. This is Christy's very first anniversary. Kim is next on our list. She is listed as four member four years at Rotary in Marshalltown. But Kim, how many years were you in three more years in Cedar Rapids? Mary. In Mary. So Kim, we're glad you, you saw the light came in Marshall. <laughs> She deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Bonnie Lauer is joining us by Zoom. Bonnie has been a member for 16 years already. Dennis, Dennis Draker, 20 year member. Betty Bowler is also joining us by Zoom today, and she's celebrating her 22nd year. Let's give her a round of applause. Lee Midlock is not able to be with us today, uh, but she is celebrating 22 years also of membership. Jim Hunt, 24. Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> he looks that young, doesn't he? Twenty-four years. <laughs> Doug Jocelyn, twenty-nine. <laughs> Scott Neff is also joining us by Zoom, and he's thirty-four years. Mike Bloom is not with us today. He's 43. And Dave Wilson, uh, 52 years as a member of Rotary Club. Uh, I added all those numbers up, and I did it right. I've got 267 years of Rotary membership, which means that the average for this month is 24 years. That's the average. So those of you who are newer members, that's a good goal to aim for. Let's go for that 24 at least. So thank you for all of you for coming. Congratulations, and we look forward to seeing you after next year. And we're going to take a photo. Awesome. That's an awesome idea. Well, he's doing that. Did any of you happen to get them all right? There's one person on this list that we didn't call out. Does anybody know who that was? Paul Harris. And how many years has he been a Rotarian? <laughs> He's our founder. 115 years. Okay. Uh, as you know, each year at this time, we have the chance to see a special video presentation that's been prepared. Uh, by the United Way Committee, and so we don't have a representative here today to talk to us, but we, Nancy is going to talk to us great by Zoom. So do we want to watch the video first, Nancy, or would you like to talk first? Um, yes, if possible, I'd like to go ahead and talk, and then we'll show the video. I didn't get what she said. Okay, go for it, Nancy. Um, so I apologize that I'm speaking with you uh, via Zoom rather than being in person, um, but I, I'm always grateful for the opportunity to uh, talk to fellow Rotarians about the importance of United Way. Um, this year is our 90th anniversary of being in Marshall County and serving the community. Um, our goal this year is $780,000. Um, our co-chairs are going to speak to you there in the video, so they will uh, tell you all the details and highlight a few of our agencies. Um, but just for my own uh, personal thought, I would like to thank all the Rotarians that have been involved with Rotary over the years. And I would ask you all to raise your hands if you've been involved with Rotary. 
and I would assume that we have most of the hands that are raised, uh, even those that are out on Zoom, I'm seeing hands go up. Um, as most of you know, uh, I am will be retiring in February of 2021. Uh, so this is my 42nd uh, United Way campaign that I've been involved with, not obviously as the director, but uh, in various capacities here at United Way. And so um, it has been a bittersweet uh, campaign this year. Uh, obviously COVID and uh, the derecho uh, and having a tornado in the last two years has made uh, United Way very challenging, but I'm very grateful to the community for their strong support and all of you for all of the support that you have done. Um, I would also like to mention today that our speaker, Nan Benson, is one of our board members. And so she is actually on uh, the staffing committee uh, and is involved in uh, the recruitment of uh, a replacement for me which I hear is going really, really well. They have lots of applicants. So I think that's great and exciting. So without further ado, uh, oh, I'll tell you as of today, we are at $392,000, which is 50% of our goal. So we're very excited about that and online and on uh, the same track as we were last year at this particular time. And so Kim is going to show the video and we'll turn the time over for that. And then if you have any questions. We are honored and humbled to serve as the 2020 Marshalltown Area United Way Fundraising Campaign Co-Chairs. My name is Mark Henson. I serve on the United Way Board and I work at Emerson. I'm Lynn Carroll and I'm the Executive Director of Heart of Iowa Big Brothers Big Sisters. This is the 90th campaign for United Way in Marshall County. With the long history of helping our neighbors, United Way continues to raise funds to improve lives and community conditions for those in Marshall County. We know that Marshall County cares about their community. The United Way provides you with a unique opportunity to support and have a broad reaching impact on our local community through the 27 supported agencies with 34 programs providing critical human services on a daily basis to those who need a helping hand. Our arc of Marshall County and we do fun events on Wednesday nights for the intellectually and developmentally disabled and this is one of the events that we're doing with handing out food tonight since we can't really get together and socialize like we normally do. And what do you normally do then? We have dances and softball, picnics and movies and we try to do something fun each Wednesday night of the year. It's a good way for them to socialize with, with each other and they enjoy it a lot. As you look around, your neighbors have received help from these United Way supported agencies who work hard for the health, education, and financial stability of those in need. This help has gotten them through the day and changed the path of their future. As you know, our community is experiencing uncertain times and yet we know that together we are stronger. It is easy to be negative in these times. Let's choose to be positive and make a difference. Your support is needed to help our United Way agencies continue to fight for the needs of our community. With your support, we have and can continue to make a difference in Marshall County. Marshalltown Youth Foundation help you get started in those activities? Oh, for sure. They're the entire reason why I started loving music in the first place. They, gar they granted me the um, option to get my hands on an instrument. And what instrument do you play? In band, I play both the clarinet and the oboe, and then orchestra, I play the cello. Okay. And are, is there, are there special activities that you've been able to do as a result of your participation in band and orchestra? Yes. I've, in band, I've gotten the opportunity to, be, opportunity to be part of the marching band there. And in orchestra, I got the chance to audition for an honor orchestra in the, at the University of Drake here in Iowa. Oh, and so what do you like about marching band? Marching band, I love the interactions you get to have with new students because the incoming freshmen are all usually shy and don't know what to say. And the upperclassmen, we all have to work hard to get everyone moving together and working towards a certain goal. Okay, thank you, Jolsey. Mm -hmm. One of the many reasons I give and support the United Way is because through the United Way, my money will reach 27 local agencies and have a broader impact than if I would try to support one or two of these passionate organizations helping our community. I give because I can't imagine 
what our community would be like without these nonprofits. Our neighbors find support in their time of need. Supporting the Marshalltown Area United Way is a community effort. We can't do it without you. Donations are tax deductible, which means if you itemize your taxes, you can claim all that you donate to the United Way. And if you don't itemize, the CARES Act this year will allow you to claim donations up to $300 per individual or $600 for a married couple from your 2020 federal income taxes. I'm Jennifer Daniel and I'm here with Hosanna. He's one of our um, four-legged helpers out here. We couldn't do uh, what we do without him because it's all around horse therapy and working with the kids um, and just all that they learn about themselves just by working with these guys, which are just such a perfect reflection of who we are and, um, and what we're made of. They help us find out who that is. Our fundraising goal this year is $780,000. Join us in making a tax-deductible contribution today and get involved. If you have given in the past, we say thank you. And please consider increasing your donation this year. If you have never given, consider starting now. Together, we can make a difference in Marshall County. Okay, Nancy, did you have additional remarks? Uh, no, just a special shout out to Mark Osmondson and Andrew Potter, and you may have heard Carrie Barr's voice in the video. Uh, we're grateful for all their technical abilities and putting it together for us. All right, ask if there's any questions. Let's see any here. Just thank you so much for your support. Well, Nancy, we want to thank you for the, all of the leadership that you've provided for this important program over the years. And just lost the microphone here. I think that was a technical problem. I think that was a person. <laughs> At any rate, Nancy, we do thank you for being a very capable and effective leader for the United Way programs for all these years. And thanks for the video. Okay, we're ready for announcements, and I do have quite a few of them. The first one was that uh, our attendance last week was a total of 30 people. We had 19 here in person and 11 on Zoom. Uh, it's the time of the year when um, we call together a nominating committee to uh, point, uh, to nominate Rotary board members and officers for next Rotary year. The committee's going to meet today and will report back to the club at the November 3rd meeting. Um, and then the election of the board members and officers will take place at our annual meeting on November 17th. The members of the nominating committee include Jim Goodman, Matt Garber, Dennis Draper, and Carol Hicks. And we know that they're all past presidents. So we appreciate their service for our club. Also, Doug Gervich has a reminder about the fireside chat. Oh, okay. Do it. Sure. I'll do it. Our fireside chat for uh, new members uh, is coming up next week, October 15th, which is a Thursday. It'll be right here at Emily Country Club from 5 to 6.30. And it's geared toward new members, but all members are encouraged to attend. And if uh, you are planning to attend, please RSVP to Kim so that uh, we'll know how many folks to prepare for. I think you'll find that it a really interesting and informative program. I'm looking forward to it. Um, also, just to let you know that if any of you out there are interested in helping to arrange for programs and speakers, Tom McCoy is looking for program chairs to help us identify and schedule speakers for the new programs. 
If you agree to be in a program chair, you do not need to attend that meeting in person. But please reach out to Tom if you're able to take on a responsibility for just one month. Um, and you can partner with another Rotary member as well. You might have lost something on here. They can't hear you very well. Oh, sorry. Okay. Just. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is this, be is this better for folks on Zoom? We just talked about. Uh, Good. Nominating committee, we talked about fireside chat, and also we're looking for people that are willing to help arrange programs and speakers for a month. Also wanted to let the club know that uh, we're organizing a holiday party committee uh, under Gary Schaup's leadership again this year. And uh, if you have some thoughts about uh, this party and what we, the club needs to do this year, please share that, those thoughts with Gary or uh, a member of the Rotary Board. Um, in addition, when we moved back to, country, to the country club, we set a goal of um, trying it for six months and then evaluating how things are going. And so that time's coming up in November. And again, if you have some thoughts about that, please uh, be sure to share that with a board member or especially with Rick Anderson and Aaron McGregor, who serve as our liaisons with um, the country club board, uh, especially with the meals. And finally, if you are a person who attends our club meetings by Zoom, it's important that you type your name into the chat box if your name is not listed on your photo in the gallery, because we're making an effort to keep an accurate account of attendance this year. So please be sure that you do that. If you just have your phone number in there, we might not know who you are. Uh, that concludes my list of announcements. I think John Fink is going to update us on the Rotary uh, Warm Coat Drive. Thank you, President Giese. As of yesterday, Kim gave us a list of those who donations or have pledged money, and that amount totals $4,500. We've received all the orders from the schools as to the warm coats that they need, and the total number of coats will be 276, which amounts to almost $5,000. So it's less than the 400 coats that we were looking for but evidently the requirements aren't as large as they were in prior years. So uh, we're still a little short uh, as to the, the funds to cover the coats. And we've also received requests as to maybe Rotary pitching in some funds towards snow boots, but we, we're still working on the logistics of that as to how to handle that. So there'll be more information on that in the future, but we'll probably be making our order through district 6,000 this week for the coats. So if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Okay, do you have any questions for John? Yes, Carrie does. I heard, I couldn't hear John very well, but I think he said we are short a few coats. Is that what I heard? And Carrie asked if we were still short a few coats. She wasn't sure she heard you correctly. We're short funds for the coats. Uh, the, the total cost of the coats is going to be roughly five thousand dollars, and we've received about forty-five hundred. So we're within about five hundred dollars of reaching our goal. Okay. Thank you. Are there other questions? Okay. Thanks again. Time for happy news. Okay, Cyclones, it's your time. <laughs> Carol Nimbus said she's happy. <laughs> Any other happy news to report? Okay, well, we appreciate um, Nan Benson being here today. Robert Thomas is going to introduce her for our program. Thank you, President Giese. When you accept the position of county recorder, you know there's gonna be challenges. When you add the position of county auditor, you know you'll be better prepared. But are you really prepared for the EF3 tornado? Those are the challenges Nan faced her first year. Nan is a lifelong resident of Marshall County, graduated from West Marshall and then Central College. She passed, later passed her CPA exam she held positions in accounting, finance, budgeting, human resources, payroll, project management, 
and software training during her career. When she heard that county supervisors were posting for the position of auditor and recorder, she said, hmm, that sounds challenging and interesting. I think I'll apply. She was first appointed October 31st of 2017. Since then, she's had a tornado, a derecho, and COVID-19 to deal with. So I guess she is right, it is interesting. So, but today she's here to help navigate through the 2020 election process. So please join me in giving a warm rotary welcome to Nan Benson. Well, thank you all very much, and I appreciate being here. Um, I think this is a great group to get some information out because you all have many contacts, and that way maybe some of the incorrect information that's floating out there, we can maybe nip it in the bud just a little bit. So Kim, can we hit through? Okay, so this is all the things we're gonna talk about, but we can skip that one. These first few slides, I just like to show what all the office um, that I'm responsible for does in Marshall County. So I have 10 staff that work for me. So as you start through here, budget, um, I'm the clerk for the board, commissioner of elections, that's why we're here, financials, um, registrar of voters, which means we keep track of all the voters, um, taxation, creating the valuations. As we go on to the next slide, um, custodian of the courthouse. I do want to point out that when I um, interviewed for the job, they said, well, this means that you keep track of the lost and found in Marshall County. You have some facility responsibilities, but don't worry about that. It's never a big deal. Well, that was a lie. Um, <laughs> so um, again, we have to keep track of all the election returns and records, insurance, licensing and permits passports, um, we deal with the Bureau of Census, Labor, OSHA, Job Service, et cetera, et cetera. And as we um, continue on, we've got two more slides of these things. You can see the human resources, the payroll, the accounts payable, that all goes through our office. Um, employee trainings, um, you know, the, we all love the, you know, sexual harassment training, you know, all of those, we all enjoy those wonderful trainings. Um, we go on recording legal documents. So anybody that's bought a house, you know, doing the deeds, those type of things, recording trade names, articles of incorporation. Then we also do vital records. So for the, all of you that haven't got the star on your driver's license yet, they did extend that till October 1st of 2021. But many of us that are a little older, we got that nice souvenir birth certificate from the hospital. That one doesn't cut it at the DOT, so you got to get the one with the seal on it. So that's something we can do at our office, along with DNR um, items as well. So we will move on to elections, but that just gives you a little bit. Um, I've decided that auditor, which is the first true county office, assessor is actually its own group, that the legislature, anything they don't know what to do with, they give it to the auditor because it's the A name and it's at the top of the list. I don't know. So elections in Iowa, we have the second longest voting day, second only to New York. Ours is a 14 hour day. Um, and very few states are like Iowa where folks can go and register the same day. So that's kind of an interesting little trivia for Iowa. Um, for voter registration, we've really expanded that now so we can do it. You can mail a paper application um, to my office you can go through the Secretary of State. You can do it in person. Driver's license is a place we're getting a lot of voter registration. You can do it when you renew your driver's license. So online, and you can again register on election day or when you come in to, if you're absentee voting in person, register then as well. Registered voter, all you need to do is come and bring your ID and vote, whether that's absentee or um, on election day. If you have moved within county, even um, if you're going to um, coming from out of the state into Marshall County, you're going to need to be a new registrant. But if let's say I live out by the sheriff's office, if I moved into Marshall Town, I'd be changing my polling location, so I'd need to just verify. 
um, my new address by one of these means. Most of the time, a bank statement, cell phone, um, utility bills are usually the things that you've got that are current with our new addresses on them. Our IDs, and we don't always get those updated right away. Um, as we go to the next slide, um, proving who we are. Um, on election day registrants, if you're registering on election day, you're not supposed to have any of these things expired. But I do wanna tell you, a lot of us, our driver's license could be expired because of COVID. As long as your driver's license date is January 1st of 20 or later, that's a valid ID. If you're voting at your same location, you're good to go. So don't worry about that, not being able to vote. But these are all of the different IDs that are there, the passports, the military IDs, um, even the, a student ID, as long as you've got a picture on that ID, that works as well for registering to vote. You would have to prove your resident address if it isn't correct on the ID. One other option, if you go to vote, you forget your driver's license, which you shouldn't have been driving, I'll just point that out, but you know. Um, you get there, you forget, you don't have it. You can have someone attest for you. So somebody that knows you can say, yeah, I know Kim, we're in the same precinct voting together. I can attest who she is and where she lives. So somebody can do that. And I think that's something that people, I never had heard of that before until I got in this office. Um, as we go down to the next one, uh, provisional ballots. Anyone that goes into vote, if we have an issue, maybe you don't have your driver's license and nobody there knows you, so you can't prove who you are, who you say you are. You will always get to vote the same ballot, all the rest of us vote, but we put it in a special envelope and that gives you an opportunity to say, bring your ID into our office following the election and show it to us and then we have a group called the Special Precinct Board that will evaluate that and should allow that ballot to count. So the provisional ballot is a nice way to give a voter a little extra time to kind of fix any issues um, and go, let their votes still count. So how do I vote in Marshall County? So absentee by mail, um, I'm guessing probably everyone here maybe received an absentee ballot request in the mail or eight to 10 of them. I've had a, most questions about why do you keep sending these to me? I will tell you, I did not send a single one to anyone. I knew the Secretary of State was sending them out to every registered voter in the state. I don't need to spend our tax dollars duplicating that. Uh, unfortunately, all these organizations also sent them out. And so um, the most I've heard is somebody receiving eight. So if you can beat eight, anybody can beat eight, she's still the winner, so she's, she's got it. Um, so the absentee ballot request, you can do it by mail, so it's all remote and safe for folks that prefer that, or I know folks that travel a lot, at least they did prior to COVID. This was an easy way for them to vote, do it on their own time and when it worked out for them. You can also vote absentee in person. We opened up yesterday, we are at what I'm calling the election center, which is the old fire station to everyone else. We are at 107 South First Avenue, so we're the north part of the building. We're actually in the base this time. So if you came and voted at primary, we're right next door. And um, you can, if you've got um, an elderly friend or anything you bring with you, we can do a car site as well. That's election day or absentee. We can come out and have two people come out and help you. And the key to the two people is there's a DNR together coming out to help you assist you vote. So we try to make it, you know, look like it's as fair as we can. I will say that um, a year from now, we're gonna be doing the city school election again. Same way, you can always do all of these things for voting, but we don't worry about the parties at that time. We just need two people going out so that it is, is two people verifying we're doing the right thing. Um, obviously, we can all go to our polling location and vote on election day, and that also has a car side option. So uh, most of the locations, um, we do recommend you bring someone with you um, so that they can come in and say that there's someone out in the car that needs assistance voting. Um, but um, we've had folks, um, we had one lady out just a 
front of the fire station. She just honked her horn until someone came out, and they did, and it worked fine. It was great. So um, we do have doorbells at most of the locations too. So if you could just get to the doorbell and back to your car, we know that as well. So um, this next um, couple slides is something you've all seen because it's the new absentee um, request form. If you don't have that and you wanna come vote at the fire station, we've got those there. So you'll have to complete it just the same. And the bottom, of it, it's actually a larger form. So the bottom of it is the instructions. So timelines on absentee voting. We have been accepting these since July 5th. Um, I know we've all been watching commercials longer than that, but we could only accept these absentee ballot requests since July 5th. And um, so 29 days before is the first we can start absentee voting, which is what we did yesterday, and is the first day we can mail out the request. So we took a lot of trays of um, about 6,400 ballots to the post office and they wanted us to have them there yesterday morning. So we got there a little before 10 o'clock so they could get them out on the truck um, by 3 p.m. And um, we will continue the absentee voting at the old fire station until the day prior, until November 2nd. Um, but the last day to request a ballot to be mailed is October 24th. So just give that time for it to get to you and you to get it back to us. Um, the bottom bullet there talks about UNCAVA voters, and they are our military or overseas folks. So if they left from an, an address here in Marshall County, they can keep that as their address, and that's where they vote, and that's the ballot they vote. So if they were um, in La Grand, Iowa, that's the ballot they continue to vote even if they're in Iraq. So it makes it kind of like a little piece of home, I guess, for them. So the other thing I really wanted to share with people, and I've had a lot of questions, and if you follow the Marshall County on Facebook, there were some questions about how absentee ballots were counted, and I, I did chime in um, over the weekend about that. Um, We've just been mailing everything out right now. We will begin, you know, yesterday we had our first batch of voters. So we had about 180 people there. At each day we run a report and it says how many ballots we should have. We count those ballots, reconcile, and we um, shrink wrap it all up. And that's the first day's ballots. As we continue, we do that each day. And the ones that come in by mail and the in-person are mixed together because they're received on that day. And we continue that process up to the election. Now, um, I'm gonna throw Kim under the bus. She forgets to sign her envelope on the outside. People forget. We will contact her by under absentee ballot request, your phone number there, your email. We'll, we'll get a hold of you. We'll, if not, we'll mail you something as well. So we will track you down to say, hey, you forgot to sign, can you come back in? Uh, the silliest one, and I really struggle with this one, if it's not sealed. So we have a peel and stick envelope. But if you forget to do that, we actually have to ask you to come back in and peel the thing off and <coughs> stick it shut. I'm a rule follower, but boy, I'd really like to just pull the thing off and slap it shut, but can't do that, that's not the rules. So. As we approach election day, our special precinct board, which is made up of teams of two, Dan and R, sitting together, begin the counting and reconciliation process of what we've done so far. And um, this year, there was a legislative council that met that allowed us to do three things. One, that allowed us to go back and use the January 1st date on our driver's license as a valid date. It allowed us to um, have the healthcare facilities come and get the groups of ballots from us because we can't go into the healthcare facilities like we used to in teams to help people vote. That's all gone because of COVID, so they've made that. And then the other thing they're allowing us to do because of the high volume of absentee is um, beginning the opening of the absentee ballots on Saturday the 31st. And you know, you'd think, well, you just rip them open and you throw them in the machine and you count them. Oh, you all need to volunteer if that's what you think we do. We um, count each day's again, reconcile each day's, and then we put them in groups of 25. Again, counting. Then we open them. Then you get to remove 
start disassembling. We will not get to where the ballots come out of the secrecies until election day, just to keep things secure. We want the ballot with the secrecy separated from the envelope with the name so that it is a secret ballot. And then all of those envelopes are put in a box before we even begin pulling those out. So it keeps everything very secret. Um, on the final day, on election day, we will begin running this through what we call the OCS, OSCI scanner. And it actually scans all of the ballots and counts all of the um, votes on each ballot. And you think that it would be slow? It's fast. It really is a very quick machine. It can process a lot of those. Um, it was a very expensive piece of equipment. Um, I think it was around $25,000 a few years ago. So it really, it does its thing, but it's very much worth it when, we, when we've got COVID like we do. So our, our special precinct board is really our final check. We are there supporting them, you know, giving them their instructions, but they are the ones that are ultimately deciding, for example, um, they would know that Kim had signed hers late. There would be a little note on, on her absentee ballot request that would say that. And on her ballot, there'd actually be a piece of papers, um, paper clip to it. So she'd know that something happened with this particular voter. And so they get to evaluate all those. So dates. So we know we've started voting. We're open 8 to 4.30 between now and November 2nd. We have a few exceptions. We are open Saturday the 24th, um, 8 to 5. We're open on Friday the 30th. We're open that day till 5, as well as Halloween. We'll be there from 8 to 5. And then Monday the 2nd, we're also open till 5 o'clock. We did get a request for a satellite voting location at Samora, the um, market right there on the corner of Main and Center. And they are very excited about doing that. We're gonna start it at one o'clock to get it, try to get through their lunchtime crowd because we're gonna actually remove the tables and chairs out of their seating area in the store. And that's where we're gonna be doing the elections. Um, we um, had a gentleman from the Democratic Party of the state call me and they wanted to set up five in Marshalltown. And I said, wow, I'd love it if we could find five buildings in Marshalltown that aren't leaking right now, but you, you know what? <laughs> go for it. And I was excited that, you know, somebody, they found a location um, with COVID. I know there's a lot of buildings that just aren't open as well. Um, so um, other dates, of course, the third is the general election, again, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. And then our canvas is on November 10th. When I first started, I went, do we throw the canvas thing over all the equipment because we're done? What's a canvas? Well, it's actually the re-counting um, with the Board of Supervisors, verifying all the information on our reports that go into our permanent records. So we know who had what, how many write-ins, those type of things. So polling locations, I've got several pages here of polling locations. We usually have 15 polling locations in Marshall County. So we are using 12 of those 15, um, just with our number of workers. So our first ones here, um, Albion, Clemens, and Gilman are normal locations. The difference is Gilman, we're adding the folks that used to go to Laurel, will all go to Gilman. And unfortunately, one of the reasons is we have trouble getting workers on a good year for both of those sites. And so we went to just having one of them. And we used the space that was larger. Um, the Laurel space is really small and social distancing would not have happened. So as we go on to the next one, we've got Green Mountain, LaGrande, and Wiscombe. Those are all normal spots for us. As we go on, we've got Marshalltown Public Library, Melbourne Rec Center, and then we've got Miller Middle School. And that is um, very nice. The school has agreed to let us be there. Um, the vet's home, obviously we can't go in there and this will allow us more social distancing, not having two wards in one location. We had everybody at the library for the primary, which worked fine because the numbers were really low then, but I anticipate things being a lot. We're all getting used to COVID. So I think there's gonna be a lot more activity on election day than there was primary time. We're gonna be very careful um, having um, our 
precinct election official. We're gonna have one station to make sure there's no student and voter contact because we cannot require voters to wear masks, but we wanna keep everybody separated. So we wanna be safe. Um, finally then we've got Redeemer, which has been um, that way. It's been there since just after I started. They, that was formerly um, First Baptist Church that's now Journey. They didn't want to be a bullying location any longer due to some safety concerns. And so Redeemer graciously accepted our um, begging, probably, <laughs> to become a polling location. Um, State Center, and then finally the Y. Um, we're using the new gym, so you'll, you can enter right from the parking lot into the gym. That's taking place of Fisher Community Center, which we all know was damaged in the show. And then I made a contact to Carol and Kim saying, please, we really need a spot. And they graciously, I think they felt sorry for us, and <laughs> said they would, we could get, get that to work for that day. Um, we're not using the college. It's a very small spot. It's a great location, but we have such a low number of voters. And actually at primary, um, we were supposed to have four workers um, that day and, or I, I'm sorry, last, last year in November, we're supposed to have four people working, two called in sick that day. We have to have three workers. So my third worker was actually three different people scheduled throughout the day to cover for it. And um, with it, it's just for Timber Creek Township. So it's a pretty small um, spot. Um, consumers, we will not be using e either. That's um, Washington and Marietta Townships. Um, I figure nobody can uh, throw me under the bus. That's my voting location. So it's also one that's a really low count. We just don't get that many people there. So my next slide is about PEOs needed. We always are looking for new people to help with elections. We are actually, um, there's been a lot of advertising and things about getting more people to help and younger people. Um, because I think, I know there was somebody that retired um, last November. Um, she was in, she was 88. She thought she should retire from doing elections. So, you know, we, we all have thing, time when things should go. And um, that's been the big push was trying to get some younger people um, involved in, in it. So we're always looking for people, but we are actually doing pretty well and pretty set for this, this fall election um, this year. Um, we do have on our new website um, a spot where you can um, go and um, sign up if you're ever interested. Um, I've got one slide of courthouse information. We've done a little more shuffling of where everyone is. Everyone on second floor is pretty much the same. The board assessor, uh, my office, um, planning and zoning and treasure. The basement has been growing and who's there. The basement we do have, I think CICS is the official term, but general assistance is how some others know it. Our veteran affairs office moved there from the vet's home and public health moved there from the hospital. So we've got a few more people there. My final slide is just contact information. The, the main thing I want to, to point out there, um, obviously all of it's good contact information, but we've just got a new website on September 3rd. And I was very excited about it. It's better, very interactive. And um, it is elections, plural, .marshallcountyia.gov. So it's a good website and always an easy way to um, get information. That election line at 754-6302 actually rings to um, eight different phones. So that when you're trying to get any general questions, it's a great number to have. That is the end of my slide. So does anyone have any questions? I would just like to say in line of the time, I'm sure that people will be happy to, uh, or that Van will be happy to hang around to answer questions, but I, I am aware that uh, I went a little long before we got you up here and I apologize because <laughs> it was very interesting. I know Jim had a question here, so hope you'll, you'll stop and talk to Nan about it. So thank you to all of you thank for you. being here today and thank you to Nan. Next week, Dr. Lance Van Gundy will be here, and uh, I invite you all now to stand and repeat the four-way test. 
Of the things we think, say, or do, first, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Uh, we are now adjourned. No, I think this is, she's great. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever give me an option. <laughs> yeah, this is much better. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me, we've got a whole school, college of people out here. So this was for the.